Heavenly Father, we do take a huge amount of joy in our being in your presence. We pray, O oh God, that you will hallow this hour, that you will do exactly what you want, that the words spoken, the prayers prayed, the songs sung, the fellowship enjoyed, the relationships put together will be all that you want. In Jesus' name, amen. Is Amen. 
dead and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, 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 the
I guess she doesn't. <laughs> Changed her mind. So, what did we learn in class today? Yeah. yeah. That Jesus is the light of the world. And where does he go? Everywhere. Everywhere. That's right. So, what are some things that you like to do? Oh. Is there some things that you like to do on the weekends, on Saturdays? Yeah. What is that? <laughs> Birthdays? Yeah. Do you like to play on Saturdays? Watch anything on TV? Yeah! <laughs> I don't see that. Well, for all those football fans out there, I like to do something else on Saturdays. <laughs> I like to watch the best college football team in Texas. <laughs> That's called the Texas Longhorns. But there are also many things that I like. And one thing that I like is to teach Sunday school. And one thing that we talked about at the end of Sunday school is we have four lessons coming up, don't we? Yeah. So this is an art. And guess what? This is going to get to be one of our lessons coming up here in the next couple of weeks. Yeah. So what I want to do is I want to end in prayer, but I want to go over our scripture today. Yeah. Was John 8, 12. What did it say? Jesus is the light of the world. Yeah. <laughs> Let us pray. Ready to bow your head? Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we just thank you for all the great things you give us. The opportunity to teach young kids. The opportunity to see this church grow. In your son's name we pray. Amen. He also asks that we pray for not only hope and healing, but for, for revival and for the renewal of faith everywhere you know I don't know I never know how to do this I really don't we want to pray for everywhere for everyone but this is where we are and we want to pray for our church family we want to pray for the church families in Victoria we want to pray for revival for faith and hope restored in Victoria we want it everywhere we really do <coughs> Excuse me, but but in, in your praying, remember Victoria and remember John Wesley. Remember the other churches. You do you do know that there are other churches in Victoria. While we were on vacation, God reminded me that there are again that there are other states in the Union besides Texas. Yeah, I have to be reminded of that every now and then. In fact. Several years ago, I was on my motorcycle heading to, to Little Rock, Arkansas for a Holy Spirit conference. And I crossed over into Arkansas and I was praising God and just admiring the beauty around me. And God had just impressed the words in my mind. Yeah, I created Arkansas too. <laughs> and I knew that I was in trouble. About 20 miles down the road, God said, as long as you feel the way you do about Texas, I can't use you anywhere. Are you hearing what I'm saying? If we are so rigidly structured into what we have and where we are, it might be, I know it is for me, it might be for you, I don't know, but it might be that God wouldn't be able to use us anywhere because our mind is closed, our heart is closed. Now, don't misunderstand. I like to. I was born and reared here. But God created Bangladesh, too, and Nicaragua. And he created people around the world. We met some of the nicest people on vacation. And God reminded me, yeah, there are nice people everywhere. Sometimes we just need those kinds of reminders. I do, anyway. So keep, keep Frank's prayer needs in your, in your mind. Let us be faithful in prayer. We really do need to be faithful. So let's spend some time being quiet in God's presence.
and just listen, rejoice in the solitude for a moment. And, uh, and Matthew, thank you for coming up. I, I know what you're going to do. I want to ask you to do this. When you come into the sanctuary on Sunday morning, would you mind just coming up and kneeling for a few seconds, just praying for our time before God that morning? Would you do that? Just consider that. I, I know you can pray in your chairs. That's not the point. It, the point is being intentional about and, and, and uh, visible about praying for this, that, or another thing. So prayer is so vastly important. Let's be quiet before the Lord for a bit. Heavenly Father, we thank you for moments of quiet and solitude. We thank you for moments when we can just get alone with you and, and just rest there. And to you who created the heavens and the earth, who spoke and light was, who spoke and the earth was, who fashioned your human creation by your own hands. To you who has no beginning and no end, but who are deeply concerned with our beginnings and our endings, we offer up a sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving and joy. We humbly bow before you, O Lord, God of the ages, God of our lives, Lord of our existence, Lord of our every days, our every moments, we thank you, Father. We rejoice in your presence and we give thanks for your mighty working in, to, and through us, for the transformation, for the, for the real change in the world in which we move about. We thank you too, Father, for answered prayer. We thank you for prayers offered up in faith and understanding. We thank you, Father, for the answers that come in love and mercy and grace. And for these, our friends and family members, for these, uh, the events that lie before us, for, for the renewal and refreshment and restoration, for the revival of faith and hope in our own community and indeed around the nation, we earnestly pray, Father, that you will orchestrate that move through your Holy Spirit and in us. Father, bring revival in us. And for these friends and neighbors that we've lifted before you, Father, we ask for the miraculous healing, the miraculous intervention, the miraculous provision that each one needs for their particular and specific need, whether of spirit or soul or of body. 
Let your love be known, O God. We relish your presence. We revel in your holiness. Forgive us, O Lord, when we have ignored the call to be a holy people, to recognize that we are a chosen race, a royal priesthood. Forgive us, O God, for standing in your way of doing what you want to do into and through us. Father, in all these things, we give you praise and honor and glory. As we pray in the name of Jesus Christ, the very prayer that he taught us as his disciples to pray with these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our hymn before the word is 2120. Spirit of gentleness. When we think of the violence in the world, when we think of the chaos, the frustrations that exist all around us, we need to be reminded of the Holy Spirit of the living God. So let's stand and sing.
Did you catch all the imagery in that hymn? All the scriptural, the biblical references from the Gospels, from Acts, from Daniel, from Revelation. The hymns that we sing are a reminder that God's still on the job, still very active in the lives of his people. So don't chafe at singing the hymns, even if you don't sing, which I know some people just don't sing. I understand that. But listen to the words. Sense the presence of God's Spirit moving. So let me ask you a question. This is a question for the ages. And I'm going to tell you right now, we're going to, be past, we're going to go past 1130, okay? It's just going to happen. Oh, Elizabeth, thank you. I forgot. See, if it's not in the bulletin, if it's not written down for me. Um, here we have, I, I apologize for, for forgetting this. Here we have um, a tool that has been exceedingly useful in the ministry that we've been involved in, the ministry of affiliation, changing uh, where, we, where we place our affiliations. And it's, it's, called the, it's been called the nest egg. You're very familiar with the nest egg. It has enabled us to pay all of the exit fees from the United Methodist Church and then some. It is now we're going to retire the nest egg. Oh, you'll probably hear from it again sometime in the future, but we're going to lovingly retire the nest egg and it will not be out anymore. It has also enabled, we are at the point where we have all the, the funds necessary to pay for new signage, again, thanks to the nest egg. Now I say thanks to the nest egg. It was just a kind of a little reminder for you and for me uh, to, to be sensitive to the needs that were uh, extant at the time when we were needing that because it wasn't the nest egg that did the work. It was you who did the work. It was God working in you to bring about something that without which we would not be where we are. Uh, and, that's, and all the implications thereon. So we have uh, appreciated uh, Belinda Walker for fashioning the, the nest egg for us. And uh, this was, it, how long has it been? It's been almost three years that we've had the nest egg. And it's been a, a part of, our, our, a part of our, our identification, I guess, for, for that long. And it's served a great need. We appreciate Belinda's fashioning it. We appreciate its use by all of you for enabling us to uh, affiliate with the Global Methodist Church. And now to be able to pay for all of our new signage. So nest egg, we say to you, we've, we're glad you were here, take a rest. <laughs> and, uh, and, and that will be good. We do thank you for, for your exceeding generosity, my goodness. Um, Paul talks in Romans, um, Romans 12 about the, some of the gifts of the Spirit, one of which is generosity. And you all certainly have that gift, and we're deeply appreciative of that. Well, let me ask you the question that is a question for the ages. Who or what owns you? What's your first response? What's your first response? I'm gut level first response. My guess is no one owns me. Nothing owns me. But I want to suggest that that is probably not true for, and we'll just invoke the 80-20 rule, okay? Just leave it at that. That for about 80% of the people in this world, they are owned by someone, by something. Okay? The 20% who are not owned are simply oblivious to being owned. 
I think that's an important question that we have to ask ourselves almost on a daily basis, depending on our particular situation. Last week we started just a two-sermon two message on reclaiming the spirit, the soul, and the body. And if you will remember, without looking at your bulletin, the, the words spirit, soul, and body are spoken in lowercase. Uh, lowercase s, lowercase s, and lowercase b. But we go over to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, and I'm going to begin again in verse 12 paying more particular attention to verse 23 today. Uh, we'll begin in verse 11. Therefore, encourage one another, Paul says, build up one another just as you also are doing. We spent some time with that. We request of you, brothers and sisters, that you appreciate those who diligently labor among you and have charge over you in the Lord and give you instruction, and that you may esteem them very highly in love because of their work. Live in peace with one another. We urge you, brothers and sisters, admonish the unruly, encourage the weak, uh, encourage the faint-hearted, help the weak, be patient with all people. See that no one repays another with evil for evil, but always seek after that which is good for one another and for all people. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, in everything give thanks, for, for this is God's will in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not pre despise prophetic utterances, do not despise the things of the Spirit of God. Examine everything carefully, hold fast to that which is good, abstain from every form of evil. Now, and I, I'm reminded you that in the Greek language there are, there's no punctuation. And so a comma could be placed after the word now, depending on a, an individual's understanding of how this is being spoken. Paul has said all of these things, and I believe he's saying, Now, may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, and may your spirit and soul and body be preserved complete without pl blame at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Faithful is he who calls you, and he will also bring it to pass. Spirit, soul, and body. And I reminded you that, that this is the only place in Scripture where this formulaic uh, statement is made with, concerning spirit, soul, and body. There is, as I mentioned, there's one other place where that is, that is indicated in, in Matthew chapter 22 and Luke 10, where the lawyer comes to Jesus and says, uh, we, you know, what must I do to be saved or what does it take to do that? And Jesus says, you are to love the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength and your neighbor as yourself. So there's a, another formulaic kind of expression of that. But here it's, there, there are three different words that have three uh, separate and distinct but intermingled meaning. And so I would like to visit with you there. I guess first we need to talk about what it means to be reclaimed and why, why, preacher, why are you talking about reclaiming the spirit, the soul, and the body? I haven't lost it. That's not the point. In our day and age, with the temptations being what they are for all of us, there are at least times when part of our makeup is at the very least tempted to stray from the ownership of God. And this is where we're going with this. We're reclaiming the human spirit, the human soul, the human body for Jesus Christ. All you have to do is watch the news on TV or read the newspaper or your feeds on your computer. To, and and you don't, that's all you have to do to know the dire straits, the dire stress that our nation and our world is in. And the, the, the sad part about that is that you and I have participated in that to some extent. I think maybe that might be one of the reasons 
Frank has called us to read through the Bible in two years, to remind us, to refresh us, to renew our memory and our minds and our hearts before God so that we might be able to stand fast in his word and have that as our staunch anchor for the living of our lives. Everything that the church does and I'm, I'm talking, I, I know what I'm saying here. I, I, everything that the, the Big C Church does is intended to be transformative. It's intended to lead to the change of people's lives. And you say, well, I'm fine. I don't need any change. That, that is not the question. That's not the point. The point is that we are all in need of change from one day to the next. We're all needing to grow that much. We're all needing to, to mature more and more in the Spirit of God. And so we, we're, we're, I, I want to say, I think that's probably, Frank, that's what we talk, that's one of the things we talk about when we talk about revival, is reclaiming the spirit, the soul, and the body of the human being for Jesus Christ. And in so doing, we then become a transformed person and a little bit more mature today than we were yesterday. And we're able to share that. We're able to model that. We're able to exemplify that for the people who live around us. For the people whose lives we're engaged with. And that's so important to remember that we do not live in isolation. We don't live in a vacuum. We live in the presence. We live in the daily presence of everyone around us. I am, I've, I've just... I was amazed. Well, I'm, I'm sorry, but for a while, some of the illustrations are going to come from vacation, okay? That's just the way it is. I was amazed at the number of times we met people with whom we had something specific in common. I was up on the top of Chimney Rock Mountain. There was no one there but the, the park ranger and another couple. We got to talking, and I find out that they're from League City. Oh, League City. I have some friends in League City. Do you by any chance know any Westbrooks from League City? Oh, yeah, David and Cindy. Yeah, I know them. I'm a thousand miles from home. And yet, there are people with whom we share commonality. Now, more to the point, as you know, I wear a lot of Christian t-shirts. And I get conversations about that. And there was often on vacation, people would stop us and say, oh, I like your t-shirt. And we'll have a brief conversation. What that is, is an encouragement to someone else. And the fact that someone mentions that to me is an encouragement to me. You see, we live together. Whether we like it or not, whether we relate well with each other or not, we live together. And God is in the process of renewing the human spirit, the soul, and the body. Now, I want to talk with you for a minute about what those mean. The spirit is, uh, is that part of us which communes directly with God. This, and this is, this is the, the definition in the, in the original language. It's the vital principle by which the body is animated. It is a simple essence possessed of a power of knowing, deciding, desiring, and acting. It, it along with the soul, is a seat of emotions and feelings. And so the soul becomes... Uh, the mind, the will, and the emotions. And it's important for us to understand that we have been created in the image of God. And as one of the speakers at our conferences last week reminded us, not only in the image of God, but in the likeness of God. You know, for some reason, that, that particular word just hadn't, ca hadn't caught in my brain until then. Created in the image and likeness of God. Consequently, we are created as tripartite with three parts. God is three in one. We are three parts. Spirit, soul, and body. And the soul is that part of us that is and part of the definition is designed for everlasting life. That's the under, that was the understanding in the Greek language designed for everlasting life, not to be destroyed by death. 
Think about that. That's part of who you are. That's part of what resides in your soma, what resides in your body. The physical body is the housing for the spirit and the soul. Now, there is a need, in, in my opinion, for reclaiming those aspects of our humanity for Jesus Christ. And I believe that what happens when revival does come is when people surrender their spirit, their soul, and their body to the ownership of God. Do you remember the Bible tells us, Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians that uh, do you not realize that you are not your own? I mean, this is the word. You were bought with a price. Your very body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit resides in those followers of Jesus Christ who populate the world. Are you allowing the Spirit within you to be reclaimed, renewed, revived by the Holy Spirit? Paul talks in Romans about the Holy Spirit witnesses with our spirit that we are children of God. And if we are children of God, we are heirs of Christ and joint heirs with him for all that God created. That's who we are. And yet, all over the world, many Christians walk around with a limp. They're crippled because they don't know who they are because they don't understand the relationship of our entire being with the God who breathed on us and gave us life, gave you life. And we need to be reminded. And so this morning, I, want to, I, I just wanna say that we need to be reclaimed. Our, and we, we need, that needs to be a conscious, intentional reclamation. Reclamation, or reclaiming is taking back something that was lost, regaining something that we once possessed. Over in John 10, in the beginning in verse 10, Jesus says, the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. But I've come that you might have life and have it abundantly. That's what, that's what Jesus does. He renews, he refreshes, he restores, he reclaims our spirit, our soul, and our very body for Jesus Christ. I'm thinking that until that happens with more and more of God's people, we're going to continue to flounder in the chaos, the confusion, and the frustration that just runs rampant through our nation and even in the church. So this morning, I just want to offer an invitation to each of us to submit and allow God to do what he wants to do with us because the future is as bright as you can imagine. <laughs> it's brighter than you can imagine with God at the helm and with us completely us, not just us, us here, but, but the people of God around, across this nation, around the world, the people of God rising up with that reclaimed spirit, soul, and body. So, there you have it. I wonder what it's going to take for us to be a changed people and for us then to be able to speak that change into the lives of other people. It takes submission. It takes just laying our lives before the Lord and saying, okay, Lord, I'm through. I, 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 I quit trying to own my own life. And I renounce those things that I've allowed to own my life. Things like gossip and slander. Things like sexual immorality. 
things like a critical spirit. And the list just goes on and on and on for the things that we as a people, now don't misunderstand this. I'm not talking about you so much as I am talking about me and all people. We have a need to be renewed, refreshed, and restored. Frank asks us to pray for revival. Well, revival begins with us, begins with me, begins with you. Revival means that we have allowed God to own us. We've recognized that our body is the temple, the residing place, the, the worship place, if you will, of the Holy Spirit of the living God. So many people are running around this nation and this world not knowing who they are. My friends, we know who we are in Christ Jesus. Let us proclaim it. Let us claim it for ourselves because that's who God created us to be. So I'd like to, for us to end our time together with a time of recognition a time of recognizing that I need that. I'm telling you, I need that. You're the only one who can answer the question, do you need that? I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask Elizabeth to come and play. Just, we're gonna, we're gonna end the service this way. I'm gonna sing that last hymn. But just to play and if you wanna come, and I'm, I'm gonna ask you if you will accept God's ownership of your life? Will you accept God's ownership of your spirit, your soul, and your body, and all that that might mean for you? I'm gonna ask you to pray right here, right now. If you wanna come up and kneel at the communion rail, please feel free to do that. If you wanna just raise your hand and say yes, I'm with you, preacher. I'm with you. My hand is raised, and I'm going to be whatever I can be to do that. I, I want all that God has for me. I want all that God has for you, for us together. And so, just, uh, and, and I don't, I'm not going to count hands. I mean, you don't have to raise your hand. That's not the point. The point is what happens here. What happens within us? What kind of changes are going to go on in our, in our mind? in our emotions, in our will? What kind of changes are gonna go on in the very deepest part of us that bring us just that much closer to God? And so, here we are. We're just gonna be praying, and I, I think um, we'll just we'll have a season, and then I'll just dismiss us with prayer. And if any of you wanna talk with me about anything I've said this morning, please feel free to do that. Uh, if you agree, disagree, you want to rake me over the coals, you want to worship uh, the, the God I'm talking about, whatever. I, I, don't, I don't wear my, my, my soul on my sleeves. <laughs> my mind, my will, my emotions, I don't do that. So we can talk about anything, but the important thing is to talk to God. So let's be quiet for a bit. Uh, lift your hand as you feel need to do that just to say, I'm here, Lord, I'm with you. And come and pray or just kneel at your, at your chair and that sort of thing. Let's be in prayer.